Girl Scout Troop 65040. Um, this is a panel discussion with five veterans from Hoppington on what it means to serve our country. Uh, feel free to help yourself to refreshments and there are pins by the door if you don't already have one. Um, our troop organized this event as a way to recognize and honor all Hoppington veterans, past and present, who have protected our country. We are particularly honored to host this event on the weekend of the anniversary of the Armistice of World War I. We would like to thank the many who helped us plan this event, and especially Mr. Henry Alessio, who helped contact the veterans on the panel, Hopkinson, Hopkinson Library for hosting and helping us advertise, and Ms. Brenda Pixie, who donated the ribbons we are handing out today. And, of course, Mr. Palaco for serving as our moderator, and the five veterans who volunteered to be here and share their stories of service with all of us. We are honored to have several distinguished veterans here today, as well as our moderator, Benjamin Palaco. Mr. Palenco served as a naval aviator in the U.S. Navy for 14 years, where he achieved the rank of lieutenant commander. He also served as a member and chairman of Hoppington Board of Selectmen from 2010 to 2016. Um, if you would like to stand to join us in the Pledge of Allegiance.
just uh, back in the, on the O'Callaghan, I was the, I was the gunnery officer, and I also had some uh, collateral duties such as uh, welfare and recre welfare and recreation officer, uh, also the legal liaison officer, and uh, also just a little background. I think there was a question about any nicknames that you had in the military, and uh, being the junior ensign on board when I reported, uh, my nickname was George. And, uh, and basically that entailed, I was the last person to sit for meals in the board room. And I had to let all the uh, senior officers uh, sit before me. And then we got underway at sea. Um, there was a tradition back then. Back then we actually had, uh, I guess, millimeter, basically, you know, film on spools. Uh, I had to show the, uh, the evening movie to the commanding officer of the ship every night. He just liked to relax and sit at the end of the evening if we weren't doing any naval exercises and watching movie. So I was responsible for setting up the movie and sitting there and watching it with them. And, then, and sometimes, uh, um, even though I had the mid watch or the watch from midnight to 4 o'clock in the morning, I had to show them the movie and they still had to get up and do that watch. So, so I went, um, when I was on there with Callahan, my nickname was George. Yeah, basically um, on both ships, uh, you know, being in kind of gunnery weapons, I was responsible for um, you know, the, the gun mounts on the ships, uh, the fire control radar that controlled the gun mounts, um, all the ammunition, the small arms, etc. And then while at sea, I would serve underway watches on the uh, on the bridge of the pilot house too. And uh, so that's basically it. That's kind of a little synopsis of what I did in the Navy is active duty. And then, I did do the reserves for a while. I was out of uh, Naval, Naval Reserve Center in Syracuse, New York, and then when I moved here, uh, Lawrence, Massachusetts, and I was like a, a training officer, security officer, all kinds of uh, different things. And then uh, I retired, I went into inactive uh, reserve in 1991 uh, as a rank of lieutenant commander. So that's pretty much it. Uh, My name is Kathy O'Leary. Uh, I joined the Navy. When I was in college, I went to Boston College School of Nursing, and the Navy recruiter came to talk to us about joining the, the Navy uh, during my junior year. And as an incentive to join the Navy for two years after graduation, the Navy would pay for my tuition for my senior year. And that was a big incentive to do this. Um, I love being in the Navy. My first duty station was out in San Diego, California. I spent three years there working on all kinds of different wars. The Navy takes care of the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps has no medical personnel, so we had a lot of Marine Corps patients. They were all very young, dedicated. Um, from San Diego, at that time, the Vietnam War was escalating. All the women that came on to our ward out of hospital course school. They were being sent over with the Marines to take care of them on the battlefield. And I just decided that I wanted to go over there too. And then we did, the Navy was sending nurses to the Naval Support Activity in Da Nang. Um, and I arrived there in July of 1967. I guess it was August. And I stayed there through August of 1968. <coughs> I was there through the Tet Offensive. Our hospital grew from like two or three hundred beds when I first arrived, and it, it was like five hundred beds when I finished. We took care of the Marines right from the battlefield. Um, it was a very rewarding experience. And after I left Vietnam, I came back to I was stationed in Boston, and I was a Navy nurse recruiter for New England. I went around and tried to talk young nursing students into joining the Navy. And that was my career. And I got married then, and then I got pregnant, and at that time, women were not allowed to have dependents, so I had to get out of the Navy. Um, my name is Alicia Shamba, and I'm um, originally you know, from Lockington for the past 25 years or so. Joined the Navy straight out of high school. The recruiter came my senior year, 
and my mom had, was a nurse, my dad had been a Navy doctor, and I had no idea where or why I wanted to go to college. And I thought, I'm not going to waste my parents' money, and I'm not going to waste my time, I'm going to go and serve my country. And so I joined the Navy. I remember I actually missed my high school graduation ceremony because my boot camp class was starting. So I had to leave the end of May, and graduation was like the beginning of June. So everybody was out celebrating their graduation, and I was off doing push ups and boot camp. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was a hospital corpsman, as Kathy mentioned. You know, she worked with and worked with the Marines. And it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And I would encourage all the young people today to definitely investigate what the military has to offer. Um, on Veterans Day, in the past, I've always gone into the school systems here in Hockington and spoken to the young people about the military and what it does have to offer. And so, Mr. Fleeco was a pilot in the military. He could be a pilot on the outside. If your dad is a doctor, he could be a doctor in the military. Anything you do on the outside, you can do in the military. It's like its own little world. And it comes out with so many benefits. I got to see the world. I met some amazing people. I traveled all over. and. Um, it was, you know, 12 years that I, I wish I could have done another 12. Uh, it, was, it was wonderful. So um, don't disregard the military. <laughs> but join the Navy! Join the Navy! So I have to sell. Guarantee you that if you go to the Navy, 
you are going to eat good. Okay? <laughs> the army, you know, I can remember the month of November. I remember November of 1963. All we had was chicken. We had chicken for breakfast. We had chicken for lunch. We had chicken for supper. But come Thanksgiving, they gave us turkey. <laughs> oh, wasn't that a thrill? And then, and then, uh, so anyway, but our objective, our objective of, the objective in Vietnam was secure communications from the north all the way up from the DMZ all the way down from the south. We had five teams that were set up in the comm centers. And uh, we did all the repair. Main, major repair was done down in Saigon. So I did six months down there. After that, they sent me up to Play Coup. Play Coup up in the Central Highlands. Gorgeous, gorgeous area. And there, my, my objective was to do an installation uh, up, at the, up, up there with the Air Force, a big comm center they were going to put in up there. Unfortunately, a friend of mine, his wife was back in the States, and she was giving birth, and they didn't think that she was going to live through the birth. So the one thing that the military did was they put him right on the very next train, and the very next the train, the very next plane, flew him back to New Jersey where he could spend his time with life. And they took me, and they said, you go down to a couple of comm centers down in the track, at the track. I said, okay, so just pack your bags, grab your rifle, and go. Said, all right, so I take the next plane down, go down to the track, I'm down there for temporary duty. You know, you pack enough underwear to last you a couple of days. You're not supposed to be there forever. As it turned out, I spent six months there, and um, it was uh, it was great. The train is right on the beach, beautiful, beautiful area. I spent six months at the train, and uh, got to meet a lot of people, got to meet special forces guys, uh, helped them out, and then and then after that, then they transferred me back uh, two months back down to Saigon. I got shipped out of Saigon, went home. Had to leave. And then I uh, went to the uh, 595th Signal Company in Fort Monmouth, back in Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. And there we, uh, we were the uh, signal arm for the 82nd Airborne. So wherever the 82nd Airborne went, we went. So the only thing I got to do with the 82nd Airborne for the time I had left was we went, we went on maneuvers out into the Mojave Desert. We had the 82nd Airborne in the west and the 101st Airborne in the east. And they had the news that for well, two weeks, the 82nd went on offense and the, and the 101st played defense and just the opposite. So we're up there and came back to the States. And then I get this judge, when I get this judge, I said, well, you know, the computer companies were really looking for people. They were looking for people who understood, you know, the Boolean algebra. They understood the names for digital. And that's why I, I had great training in that. So, I uh, signed up and I started working for computer companies. Like my first job out was with uh, Lehigh Design out of Waltham, and I was contracted to IBM Corporation and Foxborough Company. Great jobs, terrific pay, um, got per diem for being in these locations. Then I decided to get married, so I settled down. I went to work for Honeywell. And from Honeywell, I went to work for Intel. Intel. I went to work for digital, I went from digital, I went to work for Cambridge Memories, and Cambridge Memories, I went to work for Prime Computer. And after that, I got laid off on Prime Computer. And I opened, my wife and I bought a franchise and we ran a print shop for 27 years up in Sudbury. So, I enjoyed it. Does the military give you an advantage? Yes, it does. It gives you a great advantage. Uh, I, only wish, I only wish that they would extend the school year from 12 years to 14 years and give everybody would be required to go Peace Corps or learn something in the military. So you would get some, just like they do in Israel. Everybody here would have to defend themselves. My name is Ralph Gibbon. Uh, I have a double of 22 years military, four years active duty, and the remainder of the time in the Air National Guard. Uh, I was on active duty from 1962 to 1966 in the height of the Cold War and also Vietnam. Um, I, I was uh, stationed with uh, uh, large aircraft, 
the B-52 bomber uh, and the KC-135 uh, tanker refueler. And uh, I, I think why I wanted to join the military, I just didn't think uh, I, I was ready for college when I was in high school. I turned out that I was really interested in mechanical drawing. And I had an uncle that was in the military, and I admired him. And he looked so good in his uniform. And told me <coughs> interesting stories when he, when we were together. So I decided that I was going to skip college and, and go to the uh, military. Well, because I was so good at mechanical drawing in high school, uh, I thought I'm going to go to the Air Force and I'm going to be the best draftsman they had ever had. So. I went and talked to the recruiter, and they said, um, well, uh, we really don't have draftsmen in the Air Force. We, uh, we have that contracted out. Uh, and so uh, the tests that you took uh, show that you have the part, that, the, the part of the test where you look at the figures and figure out what the, the other side of the figure looks like. I aced that section. And he said, uh, our test results show that you would be uh, very good at, as an electronics technician. So that's what we'd like for you to, uh, to do. So I thought, well, I don't know anything about electronics. My dad told me that, hey, you know, go do it for four years. Try something. If you don't like it, you can forget it. And go do it else, whatever, whatever you want to do. Um, so I went. Uh, off to basic training in, in, in Texas, uh, and then I went to school for a year uh, at, uh, on the Gulf Coast, uh, 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 Keesler Air Force Base in Mississippi. Uh, received some valuable training there in electronics, and um, then I was stationed uh, full time uh, on a base on the Upper Peninsula of Michigan near the Canadian border. And it was very cold up there. We got 200 inches of snow a year. It was not uncommon to be 30 below zero and 30 inches of snow both at the same time. So I'm used to Massachusetts weather, or I was. And, but I spent a lot of time in the South. Uh, the computer field uh, was good to me. I, Fortunately, I was one of those people that, because I was a technician, I learned what was going on inside the boxes. So I knew the theory and I knew the architecture and I was very comfortable in, in that area. So I went, kind of went through the stages of uh, be, being a, a, a technician, uh, a, a, re, a, re, a repairman, uh, worked on the computers and actually analyzed their problems and, and learned programming. And, and computers were in their infant stages at that time. So it was a very valuable experience, um, which I've applied in my civilian career. Uh, I, I retired in 1994. Um, I would say that uh, it, it, the, air, the military both the Navy and the Air Force have more technical sides uh, than the Army and Marines. Um, but so if, you, <laughs> if, if, if you're interested in anything technical, uh, particularly electronics, uh, computers, any of that, um, the Navy and, and the Air Force are, are excellent, have, provide excellent training that you would be hard pressed to afford on your own. So I would recommend that if you go on active duty for uh, for three or four years, they will uh, set you up with a savings program that's wonderful, and then you can go to college when you when you get out off the active duty. Um, the other way you can do it is if you will sign up for uh, for the reserves, you will go to basic training and your technical training for six months. And then you'll come back home and be assigned to uh, a base near near home where you can commute. And it's usually uh, 
a one weekend a month and two weeks sometime during uh, during the year, preferably in the summer. Um, the beauty of that is, uh, in, the, uh, in the case of the Air Force, I can speak that that um, the Air Force would pay the National Guard would pay the full cost of a uh, four-year de degree. Uh, Minus, of course, excluding books and, and that kind of thing, but just your your fees are would be paid completely. Uh, so it's, it's an excellent way to get college uh, out of the way, and, and that um, I, I think that it is interesting to know. You might be interested to know that uh, I was in scouting and was in the Boy Scouts. I went up through the chairs uh, as a Patrol, assistant patrol leader, and all the way up to a junior assistant scoutmaster, which is as high as you could be as a as a scout. So I already knew how to take orders and give orders, and kind of knew the regiment part of it. And so when I when I went to the, the Air Force, uh, I, I did volunteer once or twice when I wish I shouldn't have, but uh, I, I did. Um, uh, what they call the barracks chief, which is the, the barracks that we slept in. One person had to be responsible for everybody <coughs> getting, getting them out and, and, and getting the place cleaned up and that kind of thing. So I started there and I worked myself up through the chairs. Um, and while I was in the National Guard, the last eight years, I, I was a, a first sergeant. And the first sergeant, is a senior NCO that is the equivalent of the Vice President of Human Resources uh, here in the civilian world. So, uh, so obviously uh, I've seen a lot of things and did a lot of things. So let's, let's pick up on that actually, Robbie. Let's, let's talk about the best or the worst experience that everybody had in the military. I think there's five candidates for that for everyone. So Alicia, why don't you want to start? Seaman. So I get him in 
sure enough, uh, right away when I get him, um, he's got an indebtedness problem. Um, what, he, what happened was he, uh, he had the best intentions. He bought uh, some, some fine jewelry for his, uh, for his mother. And uh, bend up, he kind of got, you know, duped or basically scammed. And so all of a sudden, uh, he had a lot of financial difficulties. And the commanding officer ship, they hate to get these letters of indebtedness. Uh, so I had to basically handle that. And basically, he wasn't really ready to come in my division. Um, um, but as it turns out, uh, it, he had a lot of integrity. He was, he was actually an excellent, uh, you know, person. So. Uh, Myself and my petty officers, we worked with him and actually, uh, you know, developed him into uh, basically a fine seaman and a, a you know, good petty officer. Uh, but that was kind of a difficult situation. Um, and so it ended up being basically being a good story. Um, but the other story, just uh, my naval experience is, um, I was kind of, uh, as the Vietnam War was ending, ending down, so I was kind of more in the, in the peacetime uh, Navy. Uh, one of my great experiences was, was uh, we had a couple of exercises. One was called RIMPAC 75. It was a naval exercise um, over in, uh, in the Hawaiian Islands. And basically, we had joint operations with the Canadian, uh, New Zealand, and Australian navies. Uh, so we operated with all these uh, international navies. And so we had it was like a seven day exercise um, off, the, um, off the islands of Hawaii. And uh, it was just an amazing experience of uh, just, you know, working with other navies. It's kind of a learning to work as a team, you know, the common objective of basically making sure, you know, if any conflicts arose after that, that you know, we were ready to handle them. And one of the great experiences when we pulled into, uh, you know, Pearl Harbor, it'd be my first time ever to Hawaii, is uh, basically when all the ships passed by the USS Arizona Memorial, basically, uh, you basically um, you know, have an honor, you know, basically everybody stands with attention and, and salutes as you go past them. That was a very moving experience, just thinking of all the, you know, the, the veterans that were forming that gave their life to <coughs> our country um, and you know, serving in the world. Um, so I guess, yeah, those are a couple of kind of great experiences in the day. Robert, Oh, I can remember the worst experience I ever had. <laughs> Unreal. Basic training, I'll never forget it. You go into basic training and you go to the mess hall. What you take, you take it, you eat it. Okay, no matter what. So I'm going through the mess. I never had this before in my life. It is called, yes, it's called SOS. It's an abbreviation. And what it stands, what it stands on, I'm going to tell you exactly what it stands <laughs> stands for poo poo on a shingle. Okay? So that's what it stands for. Now, I'll never forget it, and it was on my plate. And my, it was actually a tin thing that was separated from it. It had all these separation divided over here. And I took a one bite of oh, it. I cannot eat with salt. So I, I, the salty, I have to eat. And you can't get up. You don't. There's a sergeant over there. And you go over there and you show him your plate. Your plate has got to be clean. So while uh, nobody was looking, I took the SOS and I put it in my field jacket pocket. <laughs> and here I am, take it in, put it in my pocket. I got the stuff in there and I walked over and I saw the sergeant, okay, out the door I went. Of course I had to go back over to the barracks, take off my field jacket and wash it out. But I'll never forget that experience. Uh, that, that, that was my worst, so that wasn't really that bad. But anyway, my best experience was when I graduated from the um, single course school. So it was, um, but this is the one thing that they, I will tell you, the Army does have good, does have good training. Um, and when I, went into, when I went into the course, I was kind of nervous about the fact that I didn't know that much about electronics. I had, you know, I had a little bit in high school, but not, not a lot. So I can remember going up and asking one of the one of the instructors. I said to him, he says, if anybody wants to know how you're going to do, just come on up after class and I'll tell you. So, okay, this is like three weeks into three weeks into the training, and I went up and I asked him, and I said, how are you going to how am I how am I going to do? I'll take you up on that. And he looked down and he says, he says you're going to finish fifth. Really? Wow. I felt so honored. But I actually didn't want to actually finish sixth. So I didn't do as good as he thought I would do. But I think that was the best 
most probably the most exciting time with, which graduating from graduating from the Signal Corps. While I was in the Signal School, I was also a member of the Army Guard. So learning to play trumpet in the fifth grade, very beneficial because <laughs> when I get into the Army Guard, I could play the trumpet. So I used to have to play whatever You just go out there in a real cold morning, right? Your lips and you got this thing in your right hand. <laughs> you know, you're trying to blow that, trying to blow that you when it's cold. But anyway, so graduation, graduation from single school, hit my orders and go. And now the army was great because I'm going to tell you right now, I put in. I wanted to go to the Far East, <laughs> and guess where they sent me? To the Far East. Yeah. I was so fortunate. Kathy, the best or worst? Well, I should say the worst was when I first got to Vietnam. Um, we lived in ponds of high hills. We had three foot concrete walls. Metal room. They were air conditioned. We were fortunate in that regard. But the first time we had shown in the area at night, powers that be told us that the nurses do. We had mats under our cots, and the safest place were our for us to be were under our cot. So the first time we had shelling in the air, we were I got under my cot and I laid awake all night thinking that I was going to die. What did I know? So I had to get up in the morning after not sleeping, worrying that I was going to die. I had to get up in the morning and go to work. And so the next time it happened, I learned. I said, I'm not going to lose sleep over this. If I die, I die. So I'm not going to be tired. I have to get up and go to work, so I would just sleep through it. Wow, okay. Good best? Well, uh, everything was good. I just loved being in the military. Mm -hmm. Ralph, you? I don't know the worst thing. Tank on the KC-135, but go ahead. <laughs> what is the best or worst for you? Um, I would say that, that my schooling that I received in electronics was my best uh, thing that I accomplished. Um, set me up beautifully for the uh, for the very infant stages of computer technology and uh, act like as I mentioned before, having knowledge of what's happening inside the box is real helpful when you're troubleshooting and trying to figure out is it hardware, software, is it operator error, uh, what is it? And so I, I used that throughout my civilian career, and um, so I, that was definitely my best, um, the best thing I got to know there. Interesting to note, the, the worst thing, there are a couple of them, but as I told you, I, I went up through the chairs and scouting, and so when I went to the military, I was really motivated. I really wanted to do this. I thought it was great, so I tried to go hard. So when I went to basic training, um, we went to the rifle range. And I had been around firearms for quite a long time and loved to shoot and loved shooting. And so I thought this is going to be really fun. So they introduced us to the weapon and uh, I tried real hard to follow the instructions, was really careful with what I was doing. And so uh, when they graded our targets, it, you graded the target from the person next to you, you didn't grade your own target. So our drill instructor was a pretty good shot, uh, I understood, and so uh, 300 was a, was a maximum score that you could get. And so um, the TI asked, do we have anybody that shot 300 and nobody put their hands up? Um, do we have anybody at 290? Nobody. 280? Nobody. 270? The guy next to me puts his hand up. I thought uh, it turned out that I had shot a higher score than my training instructor. And believe me, this is not what you want to do when you're, when you're trying to find your way through, through the military. So uh, I was singled out several times. In fact, uh, I had a nickname. Uh, the TI gave me a nickname of Sick. And how I got that was when we went to the, the chemical warfare uh, center, uh, we had to put our mask on and go into this uh, gas chamber and 
take our mask off and, and, and say our name and, and rank and serial number and then put it back on, clear, and come back out. Well, I struggled, but I did. I was able to do that. But when I got out there, the TI was still had it, had it in for me. So he sent me back in again. So I had to go in twice. And I, I didn't make it the second time. I, I was puking my guts out. So when I came out, he says, oh, you're not so good after all. He says, you look kind of sick. Your name is sick. And so the, during the whole basic training, uh, he was bearing down on me. And my, my nickname was sick. But uh, the, other time, the other thing I, I would tell you is you need to be careful when you volunteer for something. Uh, I, I volunteer uh, because of my wanting to do well and, and, and motivated, uh, I volunteered for things. And um, we had duties when, I, when we went to my technical school while we were waiting to, to get our class. Um, we got up early one morning before, uh, we, uh, before or after breakfast and uh, before lunch, and uh, uh, we went to school in the afternoon. So uh, they had this huge pile of dirt that they had hauled in overnight and they wanted it moved from where it was near the curb back along uh, the, the, the uh, quarters where we lived and, and around in the general area. So uh, I'm looking at that and thinking, <clears throat> I see shovels. Uh, I see people having, having to do shoveling and I, that doesn't sound much, very fun, much fun. So <coughs> The, the person who was in charge said, okay, uh, here's the shovels over there, a big pile of shovels. And he said, now I, I, I need a few drivers. And I thought, drivers, that, that'd, be, that'd be a lot better. So I put my hand up. That was the wrong thing to do. Because it turns out we went over to a, uh, to a small building and right near where we were working. It opened the door and there was a, a bunch of wheelbarrows in there. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I was driving, a wheelbarrow. And believe me, when you fill a wheelbarrow full of dirt, as heaping as you can, you can take, and you have to push that wheelbarrow around, it, it just kills your upper body, chest, and arms. This I, 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 I was in really bad shape. So I, I learned to be careful about volunteering. So. Did anybody else ever have an experience to go entirely around? Yeah, we have the Army, we have a volunteer to bring. Well, that's what the Navy stands for. Never again volunteer yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I missed up, I did miss out one time with volunteers. The side of the Navy says, I need a volunteer or something. He says, you want two guys to do it. And uh, actually, we, we wanted two guys to go on three day pass. Oh. So he was like, don't volunteer, and I'll send these guys. Oh, oh, okay, I'll, I'll do a side. I'll do it. Yeah. Okay, good. Anybody else? Yeah. No, I'll get another one out with this buddy. Good. You guys got a three day pass. So, sometimes they kind of trip. <laughs> uh, how about, um, uh, let's talk about what, I mean, everyone sort of covered what they did in the military, right? What they learned, but that may or may not be the most important thing. So, let's talk about what, what is the most important thing you learned in service and how it changed you as you went forward. Well, I think that I learned that I could do anything that I set my mind to do. Okay. And I learned how to leave, and I'm not afraid to take charge or to do anything I want. Okay. Ron? I was, well, I went in the military, I was very shy. I went to high school, I was very shy, but I figured it was the military, I went to basic training, the shyness, the shyness left. <laughs> so you learn, you learn how to speak up, speak back, uh, not not to, not to superior. Right. Not talking, you know, talk back to superiors, whatever they do. They, you know, they tell you to cross, crawl, crawl across that parade ground on your hands and knees in the mud. You do it. And, but uh, that's a discipline. That's what, that's one thing you will learn in, in the military. You will learn discipline. But um, I learned, I learned to speak up, and um, I think that's kind of motivated me. Kind of. Kind of me in a hurry. William, how about you? What's the most important thing you learned? Yeah. Yeah, a bunch of things I learned in the Navy were, um, yeah, first of all, the leadership, and then also to be accountable for your actions and you know, responsible for your actions, and then also uh, 
teamwork. I uh, had to work with everybody on your ship and the other ships in the group and you know, work together collectively because we really had a goal or objective or a mission to accomplish. And uh, yeah, one time we had, uh, in the peace study, we had this, what they call the, the PV Propulsion Examining Board, where they come on board and they look at your whole propulsion system to make sure you can get underway and all kinds of safety inspections, etc. And it wasn't just the engineering department, it was basically, uh, we had to help the engineering department cover their watches, etc. So it was really a great lesson in learning of, you know, coming together as a team and working together for a common goal and then accomplishing that goal. And then, like, again, when it comes to, you know, to leadership, I found that, uh, again, when I got out of uh, school, I was, I was 21 years old, and then I've got 14 people in my division, and I've got a chief petty officer that's in his 40s, you know, twice my age, and uh, he had an alcohol problem. And so I had to, uh, and I just didn't have this leadership experience. You get a little bit through ROTC, but it's a lot different when you're put in the real world and stuff. Um, so I wanted to be a good leader, and I had some, uh, you know, good officers or mentors that helped me in that. And sometimes you just got to get out there and do it. You know, I made some mistakes, but I learned from my mistakes. And the other thing I found out about uh, leadership is to be a good leader, you have to be a good follower. Um, you really have to, uh, you know, if you have a boss or a teacher or your parents, to be a good leader, you first have to learn to be a good follower to kind of, you know, obey the rules, et cetera. And stuff. So, uh, yeah, those are some of the great things that I learned, uh, you know, being in the Navy, and it helped me in my further career in the private sector of the you know, got out of the day and everything, too. Mm -hmm. Ralph, what's the most important thing you learned? The most important thing I learned? Ralph, Ralph. Oh, Ralph. Uh, two things I touched on already. The, the training that I received was top notch and set me up beautifully for mm -hmm. a career from, that I'm now retired from. Uh, but uh, the other thing was, uh, it was already touched on. Uh, I learned and, and had a chance to practice uh, giving orders and, and taking orders. And um, so that worked out very well because at the end of my career for the last eight years, as I told you, I, I was a first sergeant. And first sergeants are, uh, uh, you, you are the right hand man of the squadron commander, what we call the old man. And, uh, so, uh, so I had all, all the enlisted people underneath of me, and uh, respect uh, has to be earned. Uh, you, you can't command respect, and so I, I never forgot that, and, and tried to do that throughout my career. And so that's not the best thing I've ever seen. Did you guys know um, similar to what Kathy says is, you know, joining the, the military at the age of 18, um, I went to hospital former school and became an EMT, so I got to work throughout the hospital and learn medical skills that even though I'm no longer in the Navy or in the medical profession, I can still put those skills to use. Um, Fortunate or unfortunate, I was at the Boston Marathon in 2013, and because of my medical training in the Navy, I was able to be a first responder. Um, so those things come in hand. And um, after I got out of active duty, I was able to go to college, get my undergraduate, go on and get my master's degree, and that's all thanks to the United States Navy. So. Um, so we've, we've obviously all, I was going to say that really positive experience in the military. And I think we'll all are coming back to a moment, some of us know a little bit than others about it. Um, but did you, did you ever feel like there was a downside to having served? Did you, is there a cost you perceive, either, either the time or the amount? Does anyone, does anyone feel like um, there was some offset to their, to their service that, that makes them wonder sometimes? Yeah. Well, the tough thing when you go in the military um, is um, you, know, you, you kind of uh, 
you're not saying completely goodbye, but you're, you're away from your friends and family. So when I was in the military, I missed a lot of my friends, you know, weddings and a lot of family events. That was, that was kind of tough. And back in those days, uh, when you're out at sea, uh, the only time we got, we didn't have, uh, you know, email or anything like that. So um, when you're out at sea for long periods of time, you know, you're lucky if you, you do get a letter. Know, from your parents, but it has to come via an aircraft carrier or a, a helicopter and lands on your ship or to drop off the mail. Um, yes, that, that's kind of a, a tough thing, but uh, uh, but then um, but it, it, it um, um, but you know experience-wise too, you, you, you kind of learn to really I guess appreciate your family and friends kind of being away from them, and then of course you kind of catch up when you come back. But, that was kind of difficult at the beginning, but you do kind of get used to it. And I really feel for the, the people that were in. You know, I was just down out in San Diego on the sea, but you know, the people that served over in Vietnam, far, far away, it has to be really difficult for them, and especially in a dangerous wartime condition. And I was really never confronted with that. Yeah, let's talk about that for a bit, your families, right? I mean, does anyone want to talk about how, they're, how they think or how they know their families felt about them, either going into service or being in the service or being over in Vietnam. I mean, is there any, is there any, um, is there anything, can you, can you, can you want to have any input on that? Lisa, what's up you do? Yeah, yeah, no, it was very funny. I'm, and I'm, while Lisa, by the way, she pointed out, has a son of the servant, yes. you, you felt this on both sides. Oh, I did, yeah. So. But, like you were saying, I mean, in today's day, you know, we have cell phones and we have emails and, you know, the postal system is a lot better. Um, but I remember, <laughs> When I joined the Navy, um, my mother was very excited. I have six brothers, I'm the only girl, and I'm a baby. And uh, my brothers actually took bets that I wouldn't last. <laughs> like, like, I just couldn't say, sorry, I'm Sam, I'm not really killed, I'm not enjoying this, you know, here's your uniform, I'm leaving now. It's not that easy. Um, but your, your shipmates become your family. So when you're in Vietnam, or when you're in Subic Bay, or wherever the heck you are, um, you know, it's, it's, your, it's your bunk mates, it's your shipmates, and you know, you celebrate holidays together, and you celebrate birthdays, and fine, you might not have turkey on Thanksgiving in the middle of Subic Bay, but that's okay, you know? So, yes, it's tough. You can't just pick up the phone and call and say, hey, Mom, how's it going? You know, like you said, you have to go through the international operator, Will you accept a collect call? So it's not easy, but you make family out of family. So that's, yeah, I'm guessing that. Oh, yeah. When you're in the military, you're never alone. <laughs> you're never alone. I can remember walking down to Times Square and, and oh, yeah. walk, walking to Times Square. And my girlfriend was with me at that time. So we're walking down to Times Square, and she says to me, she says, isn't it so funny? Look at all these people around here, and there's nobody you know. And I said, Isn't that right? And this guy comes up the back and he says, Hey, Ron, have you seen Harry? <laughs> one of the guys, one of the guys from the face. And I said, No, I, I haven't seen him. <laughs> but anyway, you, you're never, you're never alone. Yeah, you do, you do miss your family, um, but you know, that's that's okay because once you develop, you develop a much larger family. You know, with all with all, with all the friends and the buddies that you have. No, really no problem. I mean, I never had any. I never yeah, felt, I never felt lonely. So many times I just wish I could get away from it. <laughs> Did anybody come from a service-oriented family? Did you all, were you all sort of want to, you know, came in on your own? Yes, sir. Yeah. How, 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 how much of your family? Uh, well, obviously, uh, my dad and, uh, uh, I, like I said, an uncle that I admire very much. My dad was the youngest one of eight kids, and so it turns out that most of my uh, cousins were old enough to be my uncles. <laughs> most of my uncles were old enough to be grandparents. <laughs> so, so my uncles, uh, uh, particularly this one uncle that I admired very much, uh, was really responsible for me. Well, you have family too? Uh, yes, yeah, my father uh, served in World War II. Um, he was one of those, I think, uh, and actually the Coast Guard, he actually, uh, actually got booted out of the Navy. He was in the Navy, but then he determined his uh, blood pressure was too high, which he was kind of surprised he was actually in pretty good shape. But anyway, he finally got his uh, blood pressure under control, and, 
then he went into the, the Coast Guard and became uh, an officer candidate school. So they served on uh, World War II in the Aleutians, uh, the Aleutian Islands on a Coast Guard cutter, and then he moved PBYs, afterwards learned to fly over the North Atlantic uh, you know, patrol, and basically, you know, for icebergs too. But so this is a big influence, I remember. When, and then he served in reserves and retired as a, as a full captain. And, a lot of times uh, we go to pick them up, or sometimes we kind of go with them on maybe for uh, Coast Guard Reserve uh, weekends and kind of partake. So I kind of got a feel for it. So uh, when it came time uh, you know, to go to school and everything, and the Vietnam War was going on, that uh, um, I decided, you know, when I got to go and over, that I would, uh, you know, enter the ROTC program. And my mother was also, you know, very patriotic and very supportive by dad, so she was kind of she was I did have an uncle that served in the, in the Navy on our World War II. One of the um, one of the really interesting things that I've heard you all talk about is how widely traveled the military was, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you have talked some of the unique elements of being in the military to go to a lot of places, many that you can't find them out beforehand, <laughs> and you, you get to sort of really see the world. So, how did how did service affect you either in your life or just in how you view the world? I mean, how, what um, um, has has do you think changed the way you view the world really writ large? I think the, the world, um, when you come from a small town like Hockington, or you know, I grew up in a very small town called Winchenden, I mean, I had 88 kids in my graduating class. Yeah. My dad was a doctor, I think he delivered most of them. So, um, you know, this, the world is very small. And then when you get into the military and you receive orders that say Oakland, California, or Great Lakes, Illinois, or Subic Bay, Philippines, or Norway, um, you realize that the world is really accessible. And there's so many states within our own country that deserve to be visited. And there's so many countries outside of CONUS that you should take advantage of and, and go. Go to Paris. Yeah. Go to Egypt. Go to Bali. You know, the, the world is limitless. You just need to, you know, believe that you can do it and do it. Don't be afraid. One foot in front of another, step outside the box and go. That's what I tell my kids now. My daughter, uh, Brittany, is in England at Oxford studying for her master's degree. Thomas is getting ready to go to college out in Montana. It's like, go. See the world. So that's that's what you know traveling and you know being in the military talking. How about the way did, did it make you more decided to become more or less involved in, in American society when you got out? Right? Did you did you all um, decide to, to participate in any you know in the government or any sort of be involved in military organizations or anything? Or did you feel like it sort of done your job and and um and just kind of sort of go on and do your own yeah. yeah, as Alicia said, it was a great experience. I was very shy and very reserved, so going all the way out to San Diego, California, you know, what did I get myself into? But again, you make great friends with your shipmates and kind of families adopt you during holidays that you can't get home. Um, but it was just, uh, yeah, it was just a, a great experience. I'm sorry, yeah, that was a question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, it was really more yeah. on how, how did, did, you, yeah. did it drive you to become more or less involved when you got out? Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Well, it, it kind of gave me a lot of confidence. So when I got out of the, uh, the military, I figured that you know, I went to work for the private sector and then defense contract audit agency, which is just kind of the Army Department of Defense. Uh, but over the years, I decided that uh, it's good to get involved and you know meet new people. So I actually got involved in sometimes too many volunteer organizations. I'm very active with the uh, Hop with the Lions Club, the Knights of Columbus. You know, I've got the American Legion, the now the Salvation Army. But uh, but it's just it makes you feel so good to kind of get back to your you know community and your country by getting involved. So it's great that, that people you know you're going to school, but you Become you know, Girl Scouts and too. It's just a, a great idea to really kind of expand your horizons. It's, it's just really a good feeling to not only kind of serve yourself and your family, but be out and get out in the community. So it's been a very worthwhile experience. And you uh, know, sometimes I get too busy. I, I still enjoy it at the same point.
All right, and the last question, and we'll get to the audience here. So, um, and we provide for the last one. So, enough, because I want to go back to something Ron started off with. Uh, essentially, mandatory public service, right? The military is for everyone, right? And, and, and across the board, all everyone's going to be able to serve, but everyone's going to do it again, right? Every time the application is received, it's had negative impacts on the life. That's all something good, right? So, the question is, what do you all think about the idea of uh, should there be some expectations, some broader expectations aside of that, whether it's right to high school or right to college or whatever, somewhere along the way, that everybody should be expected to serve in some capacity? And again, it doesn't have to be military, it can be uh, you know, any, any sort of number of other ways. So go ahead, Ron. Uh, yeah, I think that would be great. Um, when you're, when, when, when you're, when you get out of high school, you may be obviously going to go to college. But there's a, there's a lot of things you don't know and you'd like to find out about how the world is. Uh, it doesn't have to be military. I, it, I, I think, uh, all, like Ron said, I think all young people should uh, uh, have to go to a couple of years of some kind of uh, volunteer service or something like the Peace Corps uh, or a number of organizations where you can do volunteer work and, and there's so much you learn about people and places and uh, it expands your horizon. So uh, I think I think if they do that in Israel, they have to go into the military, it's mandatory for two years. So uh, I, I think that's a good thing. It, it gives you a, it, it centers you on, on what, you, what you really think you want to do and it, it's kind of a level set. So I think it's great. Kathy, what about you? Do you think there should be an expectation of public service? I don't think so. Okay. I think who wants a volunteer that's not happy doing what they're doing? Mm -hmm. I volunteered doing a lot of different things. I was a brownie leader. I volunteered at my kids' school as a school nurse. I volunteered for Red Cross. I volunteered for hospice. And, you know, I did it because I wanted to do it. But it, to make somebody do it just because it's a requirement. I don't think you're going to have to have to volunteer for a person that does a good job. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, I kind of agree with Kathy that um, I don't want you know the government necessarily telling you what to do. I think, um, yeah, for example, uh, some people want to bring back the draft, but uh, basically, um, I had a high draft, I think it was two ninety nine, but I got in. But um, but there were some people on my ship that didn't want to be there, and so they could kind of cause them you know, problems, etc. So again, I kind of agree with Kathy. I think uh, it should be encouraged, though. You know, certain. You know, benefits like uh, I took advantage of the GI Bill, so I was able to get my MBA, um, you know, basically, you know, supplemented by you know, the government, etc. So, uh, um, so I think it should be encouraged, uh, but yeah, I don't I kind of agree with Kathy that you know, basically, shouldn't be mandatory. But I'd highly recommend it to anybody, you know, to, to get involved. And again, doesn't this have been with the military, this the Peace Corps, or the guys you know, get involved in their community, just such as you know, the Girl Scouts do, that you know, help, out, help each other. Alicia, so. um, I, I guess I agree that um, I don't get trash to draw in, um, and I don't think it should be mandatory. I do, however, think that um, the military needs to expose themselves more to our young generation, so that. You know, kids in high school have a better understanding of what the military has to offer. Right now, you know, it's, it's you know, it came, I needed it, and I went for it, but it, it has to be more than just a recruiter coming in once a year. So, you know, some of these field trips, maybe they go down to Mass Maritime in, you know, down in the Cape. Maybe they visit um, a duty station around here get some exposure, get better understanding. Because right now, I don't think our young people really get what the military has to offer. And Ron, this is your idea, so we'll give you the last word. What do you think? Well, I think that, I, I, I still think that, that there should be some something that goes on after school. There's a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of people out there, a lot of people come out of school. I came out of school, I, I, I wanted to go to RIT, but we didn't, Money. But anyway, the, uh, 
I, I still think that there should be something that falls on falls on the good school. I mean, and you talk about well, people going there because they don't want to be there. Well, yeah, I know a lot of people go to school, but they don't want to be there too. But um, you know, they they, they made it through, they go through. So I think that also I think if you had a country that we all know how to defend ourselves, I don't think we would be so vulnerable. Exactly. I don't think people would say, well, let's go attack them. I mean, that many people said, well, why didn't Japan attack the United States coming to the mainland and attack? I and mean, one of the reasons I heard was because you all had rifles. <laughs> so they made you think about it. So. Plus the fact, yes, sir, go ahead. I, yes, I, I, I had weapons when I went, before I went into the service. I learned how to, and, and I dealt with weapons. But I, I learned a lot more about weapons from this. All right, so at this point, why don't we open up the audience? Uh, if there's any veterans in the room who would like to either share or maybe thought or answer one of the questions I asked the panelists, please please feel free to you know, put up your hand. Or if there's anyone in the audience like to ask a question, let's hear it. Come on, Billy. Come on, Billy. <laughs> generation now who is interested in serving in the military, is considered ser serving in the military, but might be having second thoughts or might be reluctant because of the increased likelihood of serving in a theater of conflict? Um, I think, um, like I said earlier, whatever you do on the outside, you can do on the inside. So just because you join the military does not mean you're going to have boots on the ground in Afghanistan. I mean, you could, you know, do crypto, you could do submarines, so you could do pilot. You, there's all kinds of things that you can do in the military that will prevent you from actually being on the front lines. So, unfortunately, I think our young people have this, this image of, you know, bang, bang, shoot them up, and, and the military is so much larger than that. So have them investigate, you know, what is the draw, what do they want to do, don't think that they're automatically going to get sent to Iraq. So that would be me. Oh, Kids today can join the Civil Air Patrol. My grandson, who is 14, and he can join at 12. He lives in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. But he is very active in the Civil Air Patrol. He's learning how to fly a plane. And his goal is to go to the Coast Guard Academy and fly helicopters. He's 14. I was going to say, obviously, I think you need to be careful what you choose. Uh, you don't join the military just for the purpose of joining it, uh, because maybe you didn't know what else you wanted to do after you got out of school. Uh, because if you if you don't have, if you're not motivated to something uh, that you want to do, 
that they will find something for you to do. And if they do that, it may be uh, something that, uh, that puts you on the front lines uh, in, in the action, and then you, you that, that's not good. So um, it, it, a little bit of caution about what you want to get. You, the idea is to get some training or something you can use uh, after you get out of the military uh, in, in your civilian life because you've got a whole lot of years ahead of you once you get out of, of the military and uh, get your college out of the way. And, and so that, that training is just uh, immeasurable. Yeah. I have a question just about, we talked a little bit before we started about if there was a, um, a book or a movie or a show that you thought that you sort of think of with respect to your service that it was either relatable or comparable or, or the opposite, completely ridiculous that you think, you know, doesn't depict the military in the way that it should. Um, or some, some book or movie that you recommended. Just wondering if, if all of you have thoughts on that. I, uh, when, you, when you mentioned that, I, I, I think the, the movie was called Full Metal Jacket, um, military. And I saw that, I, I, I'm sorry, but I have turned it off. And the reason, I mean, I watched part of it, I turned it off, and I said, you know, when I went into basic training, I get in there with, I get in there with NCOs and officers, that they were training you, they didn't ridicule you, okay? The Army, the Army really, never really picks out anybody. Uh, your, your own your own peer members are the ones that are going to take you. They go, they're going to they're going to strengthen you, but they're going to make they're going to make you right. But when I saw that movie, I said these these people that I had to train me were training me for one reason. They were training me how to stay alive. They weren't training me to go out and shoot myself. They're training me to live. And they were most of most of them were combat veterans when you go to basic training. Probably 99% of them combat veterans. And they've been through combat. So uh, that was one movie that, that I saw that I just uh, I didn't, didn't care for at all. And I think that I think that Hollywood has a tremendous uh, depiction on what really goes on. And um, one of the movies, uh, for example, Argo, um, Argo, that one. A friend of mine in town after the no no quite a bit going on in the government. He says a lot of that was totally fictitious. Uh, but in Zero Dark Thirty, much of that was very very true. The only thing that in Zero Dark Thirty was that they combined it into one woman. This one woman she pursued it. However, if it was real, it was actually five women. But if they had that movie showing five women doing what they were doing, you probably Yes, uh, how many have ever seen the movie Apollo 13? Uh, for some reason, I've probably watched about 20 to 30 times, even though I know exactly how it's going to end. I always love watching it because, as I mentioned before, it really embodies the spirit of you know people working together for a common goal. And of course, uh, Apollo 13, they had an accident, and basically it was kind of a a rescue mission to get Apollo 13, you know, back, you know, back to Earth, and it was just an amazing movie. I think kind of very inspirational, um, with how everybody NASA, and of course, you know, the pilots are ex-military, etc., just working together, um, you know, to basically come home. And the great thing about this movie is no one dies in the movie. You know, for, you know some other movies, it's, it's kind of a fact that life they die. But anyway, I found that you know very inspirational. I just I, I love watching it every, every time. Ralph? Uh, my favorite movie is uh, Airplane. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was interesting that I, I guess I'm a little bit methodical, but um, uh, in the movie, they're boarding a jet airliner, and uh, that's the way it starts out. And once they take off, and, and, and you, if you, if you, Keen and you hear it in the background, it sounds like a propeller-driven airplane. So there's so many things that that if you have been exposed to uh, 
aircraft and, and the way things are, like I was in the airport, and I, you pick up on these things that uh, most people maybe you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't care about or you wouldn't hear, or you wouldn't recognize, but so many things are uh, uh, not, not what they should have been. The Rock and I'll say Top Gun is a completely ridiculous depiction yes. of naval aviation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anybody else got any questions? All right. Who's that? Okay. All right. Well, in that case, let me ask you please give a round of applause for our wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Let me also ask the girls of Troop 65040 to stand and let's give them all a round of applause.